Hi everyone, my name is Charity Hagen and I'm a park aid interpreter for the Riverside County Regional Park and Open Space District. And I'm here today at the beautiful Santa Rosa Plateau Ecological Reserve in Murrieta to help you all learn about a very unique wetland called a vernal pool. This talk will last around 20 minutes. So if you need to get a drink of water or stand up and take a quick stretch break, feel free to go ahead as I get started. So yes, we are here at a wetland called the Vernal Pool. And if you look behind me where this boardwalk is, you can see this field of dried brown grass. Doesn't look very wet, does it? Well, that's because this is called a seasonal wetland. So this is wet part of the year, but this is October. This is the dry season here on the Santa Rosa Plateau. We haven't had any rain in months. And so that's why this wetland has dried up because this is our dry season. Now, Vernal Pools, need three things to form. Now we see here behind me the boardwalk right here, but look on the edge of the boardwalk, you can kind of see the edge of the vernal pool right there next to this field of uh, dried brown grass. A vernal pool needs three items to form. First, it needs a non-porous soil. Now up here on the Santa Rosa Plateau where our vernal pool is located is actually an ancient lava flow. Now this lava flow did not come from a volcano. It came from a crack in the earth and it formed the um, basalt mesa that we're standing on today. So basalt is made of lava rock, and I have here an example right here. So here's a lava rock. You can see it has the holes in it. That's kind of indicative of lava rock. So the lava rock, or the basalt mesa, uh, the soil is very non-porous, which means water does not flow through the soil very easily. The soil actually soaks up the water kind of all out like a sponge. So the water is going to soak into the ground, and that's what's going to form the vernal pool. So it needs a non-porous soil. It also needs a shallow depression. And if you look behind me at the boardwalk right here, you can kind of see the edge of the vernal pool right over there. Uh, you can kind of get an idea of the shallow depression that is up here on this mesa. And vernal pools also need winter rains to form. Now it's October, it's the dry season right now. Hopefully in a couple months when winter comes here to the Santa Rosa Plateau, we'll start getting winter rains to fill up the vernal pools. Now the vernal pool to start forming actually needs about five inches of steady rain. And once five inches of rain come, the ground is going to be so saturated that that pool is going to start forming. Now we pretty much need those five inches of rain over a period of several weeks. If we get an inch of rain one week and then two weeks later we get another inch of rain with warm spells in between, now the vernal pool is not going to form. Um, there's a thing called evaporation and when it warms up, water starts evaporating. So even though the water is in the soil, it might start evaporating if it warms up. So some years the vernal pool does not form at all. Uh, some years we get no water in our vernal pool, some years we get a little bit of water in our vernal pool, and some years this whole vernal pool is absolutely full of water. It's amazing. So I'm going to show you what the beginning stage of a vernal pool looks like. So if you can see this picture right here, you can see there's water mixed with plants. Now the plants you see behind me that are brown and dry right now, there's actually plants here waiting for the winter rains to start and they're going to, the seeds are in the soil, they're going to germinate and sprout, and they're going to start growing as soon as those winter rains come and the soil gets saturated. So if you see in this picture, you can see the water as the vernal pool starts filling up. You can see the green plants that are turning green, and once these plants start growing, they're going to start doing that photosynthesis to be able to survive in this vernal pool. So this is what the beginning stage of the vernal pool actually looks like. Now at this stage, several things start happening. As soon as the winter rains start, it stimulates uh, the breeding season of frogs and toads. So I have here a picture of a Pacific chorus frog. So as soon as those winter rains come, these guys are going to come out at night and they're going to start croaking. And these guys are maybe a couple inches long, but they have a very loud croak. If you've ever heard them before, they can be really loud. So the Pacific chorus frogs will start coming out looking for mates. And this is also when the western toads are going to come out. Now the western toads, they don't croak like a Pacific chorus frog. They actually sound more like a western screech owl, if you know what that sounds like. Um, it's a very interesting, unique call. And so these guys are going to come out and they're going to start looking for mates during this season. So that's the beginning stage of the vernal pool. Water, the soil gets saturated, water starts filling up, hopefully, and then our critters start coming out to respond to the uh, water filling up the vernal pool in the seasonal wetland. 
And this is what the full stage looks, looks like. Believe it or not, it looks like a very deep, beautiful lake. Um, but in fact, it's not deep at all. It's maybe about 18 inches, a foot and a half deep. If you look behind me at the boardwalk over there, the water usually gets up to the bottom part of the boardwalk, and that's not very deep, is it? But it is a beautiful lake, and you don't see any plants sticking out of the water either. They're completely covered in water. But even though those plants are completely covered in water underneath the water, the sunlight still can penetrate that foot and a half deep vernal pool to provide the plants with the fuel they need to do the photosynthesis to survive here in this seasonal wetland. And this is also the time when those Pacific chorus frogs and western toads I told you about are going to lay their eggs. They need water to lay their eggs in. So they're going to lay their eggs. And then the migratory birds are ducks that, went, that, that nest up in the northern parts of the United States, way up north in the Arctic. They're going to come down here to spend the winter to feed on the animals and the plants that live in this vernal pool. So that's the full stage of the vernal pool. Now when the vernal pool is full, there's going to be all kinds of little critters hatching from their eggs um, that are in the ground. So if you look behind me right here, it's very dry looking, very brown, but believe it or not, there are actually thousands of little creatures in eggs waiting for the vernal pool to start filling with water. And they're going to hatch, and they're going to come out, and they're going to do their life cycle, go through their life cycle. So we're going to learn about some of these very unique creatures today. First one we're going to learn about is this one right here. This is called a Daphnia otherwise known as a water flea. Now, if you look at this interesting little creature, it's got these, what looks like little antennas right here. Actually, those little antennas help them to move along through the water. So they kind of look like a flea. They uh, move like a flea, but they're not a flea. Uh, these guys are little crustaceans that live in our vernal pools. So they're gonna use these little antennas, actually, they're to filter feed, they're filter feeders. They're gonna feed on the microorganisms that are present in the vernal pool. They'll also feed a little bit on the algae that's gonna start growing in the vernal pool as well. And if you look at this one, it's got a bunch of eggs in there. So this must be a female, has an has a egg sac container inside of her body. And these guys are only about two millimeters long. Most of these creatures you're going to learn about are very, very small, they're not very big at all. So that's our Daphnia, our water flea. One of my favorites is this one right here. This is a copepod. Copepods are really cool. They have these really cool long bodies, long tails, and really cool looking antennas up there. And if you look, it looks like they have a red eye right there. It's actually not an eye. It's just a red dot on their body. But copepods are predatory um, arthropods or crustaceans. These guys are going to hunt those daphnias, those water fleas I just told you about. They're going to hunt other microorganisms in the pool. And they're also going to um, hunt some of these other creatures that we're going to talk about. And they'll eat a little bit of algae as well. So these are our copepods. Now the next creature we're going to learn about is really cool. This is called a planaria. This is a species of flatworm. Now these guys are really cool. They kind of shimmy along the surface of the vernal pool. They use the water tension to crawl along the surface. And these guys are predators as well. Now what they have in their body is there's a pharynx that connects the head to the stomach. You know what they do? They stick that pharynx out of their mouth into the prey that they have captured, insert some digestive juices into their prey, which liquefies their prey, and they suck it up pretty much like through a straw. Pretty wild. And also planarias, if they happen to lose a part of their tail, a tail gets cut off, maybe by a predator, guess what? They can grow a new tail back. Their head gets cut off, they can actually grow a new head. They can grow two heads if they'd like. Or if half their body gets cut off, a new planaria can grow from that half that was cut off. They're very unique, very interesting creatures. And yes, they live here in the vernal pool on the Santa Rosa Plateau. So that's a planaria, very cool creature. Now we're going to learn about some insects. This is a chronomid midge fly larva. So midges are those little insects that buzz around your ears when you go to any wet areas. Kind of like to get in your ears sometimes. Well, those are midges. Uh, they're not mosquitoes, so they don't bite. They just kind of annoy us. But this is what their larva looks like. It's a chronomid midge fly larva. Now, what color is it? It's red, yes. Well, this creature has a lot of hemoglobin inside of its body. And the hemoglobin gives it the red color, and the hemoglobin will help it to survive low oxygen environments, uh, which is what we have here in the Santa Rosa Plateau in this vernal pool, as a, especially as the water level um, uh, goes down. Oxygen supply goes down with it, so this guy can survive even in low oxygen levels in the water. And some years we have big hatches of these midge fly larvas, and you could come out here to this boardwalk and you'll see just all kinds of hundreds of them floating around in the vernal pool. Actually really, really cool. So that's our midge fly larva. We also have dragonfly larva. 
So dragonflies are those beautiful creatures, those beautiful insects that flit around our uh, ponds, our pools, come in all kinds of different colors. This is what their babies look like. This is their larva. Um, so these guys are going to spend time mostly at the bottom of the vernal pool, but they're actually voracious predators. They pretty much will grab whatever creature comes within um, range of these grasping arms that they have, and then they'll move, those, uh, move the prey up to their mouth, and they're going to devour that prey. Uh, these guys are great for mosquito control. A lot of these creatures are great for mosquito control, but these guys are a little bit bigger than some of the other creatures I've uh, showed you today. Um, so they're really great for controlling mosquito larvae. We don't want mosquitoes around, do we? All right, I've saved the best, la best for last, the coolest creature here in the vernal pools of the Santa Rosa Plateau, is our fairy shrimp. So here's what they look like. Now, fairy shrimp are not called that because of the way they look, though some of you might think they look like fairies. Um, they're actually called fairy shrimp because of the way they just magically appear in the pool. One day, there's nothing in the pool, then you'll come out here the next day, there will be hundreds of these guys swimming around in this vernal pool. These guys have about 11 pairs of legs that they use to swim around with and they use this little appendage up here to filter feed. So they're going to feed on microscopic particles, microorganisms. They are filter feeders. So up here in the Santa Rosa Plateau, we have two species of fairy shrimp. We have the vernal pool fairy shrimp, which is a federally threatened species, which means it's pretty rare. Not very many of them left anymore. Um, our vernal pool fairy shrimp, their lifespan is actually about 45 to 60 days. So a month and a half to two months is their lifespan, very short lifespan. Most of these creatures I've shown you have very short lifespans. Um, so these guys have a month and a half, two months, and they're about an inch long. So these are a little bit bigger than some of the other critters we've learned about. We also have a species called the Santa Rosa Plateau fairy shrimp. That's our special fairy shrimp because it lives only in this vernal pool behind me here and a few scattered vernal pools nearby. Uh, which means it's endemic to the Santa Rosa Plateau. Lives only here and nowhere else in the entire world. And I'm going to show you what they look like. I have here some Santa Rosa Plateau fairy shrimp in a jar. So I'll hold this up to the camera. Can you see those little guys moving around in there? Can you see that? So you can see those little kind of whitish translucent. So these guys are a little bit smaller. They're about a half inch, so actually about half the size of, a, of the uh, vernal pool fairy shrimp. But their lifespan's a little bit longer. Their lifespan is um, up to 60 to, 60, 60 to 70 um, days. So they have a little bit longer of a lifespan, our Santa Rosa Plateau fairy shrimp. So Santa Rosa Plateau fairy shrimp, they hatch from cysts or eggs that are in the soil. And then when they hatch, they're pretty much ready to go. They don't go through, they go through a few molts in their life cycle while they're here in the vernal pool, but they're pretty much hatching fully formed, able to take care of themselves. And these guys only raise one generation of fairy shrimp per year. Some of these other creatures I've showed you will raise multiple generations sometimes, but the fairy shrimp, it's only that one generation. And here's a picture of a female fairy shrimp. You can see the eggs in her little egg sac right there. Now the female fairy shrimp are actually different looking than the males. Females have this egg sac on the end, smaller head, and the males actually have a big bulbous head with these claspers up near the head uh, to grab the female during the breeding season. And if you come out here to the Santa Rosa Plateau, come on this boardwalk, if you get down and look in the water really closely, you can actually see these guys swimming in the water. It's really, really cool. Um, so these are fairy shrimp. And these are food for those migratory ducks I told you about. They're food for some of these other predatory copepods, planarias that I told you about. But that's our Santa Rosa Plateau and vernal pool fairy shrimp. So all these creatures, they hatch, they go through their entire life cycle in this vernal pool, and hopefully they can finish that life cycle before it dries up. Now, yes, the vernal pool is going to start drying up. Sometimes the vernal pools can last for months. Sometimes they don't last very long at all. And sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, they don't even form at all. But when the vernal pool starts drying up, it's usually typically March or April is when the vernal pools start drying up. That's because our rainfall starts getting less and less as we get into spring. Evaporation rates are gonna go up as the temperatures increase, and the vernal pool is going to start drying. So when it starts drying, flowers are going to start coming up along the edge. They're stimulated by the drying of the vernal pool, and also by the, that increase in springtime temperatures. It's going to spur the germination of a wide variety of flower seeds. So this shows a picture of one of our vernal pools. The water is receding and you see a nice ring of what's called gold fields, gold field flowers around the edge of this vernal pool. So as the vernal pool starts receding, these animals are going to quickly 
finish their uh, life cycle um, so they can come back again next year. But this is also the time when those tadpole or those, those uh, toad and frog eggs have been in the water. It's going to hatch into tadpoles. The tadpoles are going to start swimming around, turn into frogs. So there's a wide variety of food for creatures, such as this one right here. This is a Hammond's two-lined garter snake. So these guys are going to come out probably March or April when the water level is a bit lower and they're going to go hunt for those tadpoles um, that are out here at the vernal pool. And some years we have all kinds of baby frogs and toads hopping around in the springtime. This last spring was phenomenal. We had so many frog and toads hopping around up here. It was absolutely amazing. Um, so these guys are one of the main predators of those little creatures. And also the migratory birds, those ducks are going to depart and head back north. Their food supply is diminishing, the temperatures are rising. So the migratory ducks are going to head back north up to the Arctic. And birds like great egrets, white-faced ibis are going to move in. They're also going to feast on those tadpoles and those baby frogs and baby toads that are hopping around here uh, at the dry invertible pool. So the vertical pool, uh, the level will keep going down, keep going down, and eventually the water will completely disappear. And then this really cool flower is going to come up. This is one of my favorite flowers here on the Santa Rosa Plateau. This is called Downingia. It's very beautiful. It's got purple edges, white and yellow in the interior of the flower. Some years there are carpets of this flower all over this dry invernal pool. And the, around the boardwalk area is a great place to see this in the springtime. Sometimes you can get really close looks at these. Sometimes there's carpets of these out here um, at the dry invernal pool. So these guys are going to come up and they're going to, um, this is pretty much the last thing that happens here before the vernal pool goes dormant for the season, before it goes dry for the season, is the down in here are going to come up. So at that point in time, uh, these creatures that have laid their eggs, the Daphnias, the uh, copepods, the fairy shrimp, all their eggs have settled down into the soil. And actually, there are thousands upon thousands of these eggs currently in the soil right here. Now, these eggs can survive a very long time without hatching. Some scientists did a study and they found some copepod eggs. Somehow they tested them to be 300 years old. They put those eggs in water and guess what? They hatched. So these eggs are actually um, glorified embryos. These embryos inside these eggs have everything they need to survive a very long time. And if they have to, they can go dormant and they can wait for those winter rains. This is California, winter rains can be fickle. Some years we get abundant winter rain, some years we get no winter rain. And the years we don't get winter rain, those cysts are just going to sit in the soil, they're going to wait in the soil, and they're going to wait for the rains to come, saturate the soil, and start filling it with water. Now when these eggs do hatch, only about 3% of those eggs are going to hatch. Now, if you're a creature that lives in a vertical pool that fills up and dries, sometimes pretty rapidly, sometimes within a matter of weeks to several months, you need to finish your life cycle pretty quickly. Um, but you're not going to want all your eggs to hatch, are you? Because sometimes the vertical pool fills up and it dries again two weeks later. And if all of your eggs have hatched and that vertical pool has dried up, well, guess what? Your entire population is going to go extinct. And you don't want that to happen, do you? So that's why only about 3% of all of these eggs and, or cysts of these species are going to hatch here um, at the vernal pool. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about vernal pools today. We've learned what causes vernal pools to form. We've learned they need non-porous soils. We need We've learned they need winter rains. We've learned they need a nice shallow depression, like upon this basalt mesa here on the Santa Rosa Plateau. We've learned about some pretty cool and unique creatures that survive and even thrive in the seasonal wetland. And we've learned about the cycles of uh, the seasonal wetland. It's filling and it's drying cycles. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about all this today. Now, if you'd like to come visit the Santa Rosa Plateau, the boardwalk area is currently closed, but hopefully will open soon. And you can come out if we have abundant winter rains and you can see these creatures for yourself. You can come out on this very boardwalk that you see behind me right here. Come down, you can sit at the edge of this boardwalk and stare in the water and hopefully you'll see some of these really cool and very unique creatures that live here on the Santa Rosa Plateau. So on behalf of the Santa Rosa Plateau and the Riverside County Park and Open Space District, I hope you've enjoyed learning about seasonal wetlands called vernal pools. And we look forward to seeing you here on the Santa Rosa Plateau. Bye-bye.